Shalom from Israel to all of the Daystar viewers around the world. I'm Oshi Bartzvi, the producer and founder of Israel Now News. We at Israel Now News are dedicated to bringing you the full story and the truth about Israel from Israel. It's written in the Holy Bible when David said in Psalm 25:5, Lead me in your truth and teach me, for you are the God of my salvation. For you I wait all the day long. And God says in Zechariah 8:16, These are the things that you shall do. Speak out the truth to one another. Judge with truth and judgment to peace in your gates. And always search for the truth, and the truth shall set you free. John 8:31. I hope you enjoyed the program. God bless you from Jerusalem. Shalom, shalom. Welcome to Israel Now News. I'm Yochanan El Rome. And I'm Erin Viner. In our top story, the Pentagon has successfully destroyed a replica of an underground nuclear facility. In an experiment to test its ability to destroy a fortified nuclear site, such as the embedded Fordow plant in Iran, the Pentagon held field exercises and successfully destroyed a replica of a fortified nuclear facility. The results of the exercise, which were considered to be resoundingly successful, were relayed to U.S. allies, including the State of Israel. These results will hopefully convince Iran and its enemies of America's ability to destroy an Iranian nuclear site in a single strike. The experiment utilized a 13-ton bunker buster bomb, which penetrates its target two times faster than the speed of sound. According to diplomatic sources, a recent powerful earthquake has damaged Iran's only power-producing nuclear reactor, and enormous cracks are now visible along the side of the structure. Tehran insists that the facility is functioning properly, although the international community, which has already raised concerns over the safety of atomic development in the Islamic Republic, is expressing skepticism. Russia has deployed a naval unit to the Mediterranean Sea. Russian President Vladimir Putin has stationed 16 naval warships and three helicopters in the region as tensions increase between Moscow and the West over possible intervention in Syria. Western diplomatic sources said Russia is flexing its muscles by moving the fleet close to Syria, marking their first permanent naval deployment in the Mediterranean since the Soviet era. Authorities in Turkey have arrested at least 15 Iranian agents for alleged involvement in the most dramatic protests to sweep the country in decades. Turkish media is reporting that a man suspected of instigating the wave of demonstrations maintained close contact with Iranian intelligence agents. There have also been additional reports of activity by the Iranian Revolutionary Guards on the ground in Turkey fueling anti-government rallies aimed at overthrowing the country's leader, Prime Minister Recep Tayyip Erdogan. Just one month after the U.S. sent 200 soldiers to Jordan to assist in containing the violence spilling over the Syrian border, the United States has agreed to send F-16 warplanes and anti-missile batteries to the Hashemite Kingdom. King Abdullah requested the military hardware to assist Jordan in protecting itself from a spillover of the Syrian civil war. After the conclusion of a massive joint military exercise between the two friendly countries, the U.S. will leave Patriot missile systems as well as fighter jets in Jordan. Austria has begun the withdrawal of its 380 peacekeepers from the United Nations Disengagement Observer Force stationed between Israel and Syria. The decision to pull out the troops follows the breaching of a U.N. border crossing by Syrian rebels who briefly took control of a U.N. compound last week. Peacekeepers were reportedly left scrambling for their bunkers during the fighting, and several were wounded. The post was later forcefully captured by Syrian forces. Austrian Chancellor Werner Feynman released a statement saying that freedom of movement in the area no longer exists, and the uncontrolled and immediate danger posed to Austrian soldiers has risen to an unacceptable level. UNDOF will now be staffed solely by troops from Chile, India and the Philippines, although Manila is also considering the withdrawal of its own troops. Israel is expressing concern over the future of the mission and has since the beginning of the Syrian civil war. 
The Israeli Foreign Ministry released a statement saying that Jerusalem appreciates Austria's longtime contribution and commitment to peacekeeping in the Middle East and not only regrets the decision, but hopes that it will not lead to a further escalation in the region. The statement also stressed that Israel expects the United Nations to uphold its commitment under Security Council Resolution 350 that calls for monitoring of the ceasefire between Israel and Syria in the wake of the Yom Kippur War. Security personnel at Safed Hospital were forced to evacuate the facility when a Syrian man they were treating was found carrying a grenade. According to reports, Israel accepted two Syrian fighters badly wounded from the conflict in their country. When medical staff began removing clothing from one of the men to assess his wounds, they discovered a fragmentation grenade in the pocket of his pants. The explosive device was safely detonated at the scene and no one was injured. Israel continues to accept an influx of wounded Syrian refugees despite the security risks they pose. Patients are treated, rehabilitated, and in most cases, Israel assists them in returning to Syria without detection so that they will not be accused of collaborating with the Jewish state. Dozens of Syrians attempted to breach the Israeli border last week. The group said that they were hoping to seek refuge in Israel after their lives were endangered when fighting reached their city. The IDF allowed them to stay at a border crossing until it was determined that the fighting had ceased and that it was safe for the IDF to assist the Syrians back safely across the border. The leader of al-Qaeda released a special video message for terrorists fighting in the Syrian civil war. In his 22-minute recorded message, Ayman Zawahiri encouraged all Syrians to unite to overthrow President Bashar al-Assad, then to free Palestine from the Jews. He said there is no solution for Palestine except jihad, and that every free Muslim in Palestine should unite with his Muslim brothers to implement Sharia law and rule by it, and to liberate Palestine in order to set up an Islamic state. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu made a special appeal to Palestinian Authority President Mahmoud Abbas from the Knesset podium last week, personally inviting him to return to negotiations with Israel, saying that because Abbas does not speak Hebrew and his own command of Arabic is only so-so, Netanyahu said that he would address the Palestinian leader in a language that both understand by saying, give peace a chance. Netanyahu added that the citizens of Israel want peace and that he wants peace and security, going on to say that anyone familiar with the details of the negotiations knows that Israel is not the side evading the talks nor obstructing them. Netanyahu stressed that the important thing is not to impose preconditions but simply to enter negotiations. He told his cabinet that while he is eager to restart negotiations with the Palestinians, the Jewish state will continue to build in Judea and Samaria, despite the Palestinians' insistence that there be a construction freeze in order to establish facts on the ground in places where they intend to declare a future state. Israel's Prime Minister argued that those communities don't substantively change the ability to reach an agreement with the Palestinians and that the real issue is whether or not the Palestinian Authority is willing to recognize the Jewish state. The Palestinian Authority is pressuring Israel to release 120 terrorists who are serving sentences in Israeli jails. In an attempt to manipulate Israel as it eagerly awaits a return to negotiations with the Palestinians, Fatah is demanding that Israel release 120 terrorists as a sign of good faith. Hussein al-Sheikh, a spokesman for the Fatah party, told Israeli radio that releasing 120 Palestinian prisoners will provide a good atmosphere. He went on to say that Israel freed 1,500 prisoners in negotiations with Hamas in the Gilad Shalit deal, so why shouldn't it turn loose 120 Fatah prisoners? On the 46th anniversary of the reunification of Jerusalem, the Congressional Israel Allies Caucus urged the White House to move the U.S. Embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. Congressman Doug Lamborn expressed his strong belief that Jerusalem should be recognized as the capital of Israel with no waivers and no caveats. Congressman Brad Sherman said it is long overdue for the U.S. government to relocate the embassy to Israel's capital and called it a no-brainer. The U.S. Congress passed the Jerusalem Embassy Act in 1995 authorizing the relocation but included a postponement clause permitting the president to delay that move every six months in the interest of national security. 
Since that time, every sitting president has vetoed the embassy relocation twice each year. This latest push by congressional representatives is meant to encourage U.S. President Barack Obama to not repeat that action and instead actually move the embassy to Jerusalem and declare once and for all that the United States recognizes Jerusalem as the capital of the State of Israel. The European Union has signed an Open Skies Agreement with Israel, which will allow for more frequent and less expensive flights between Europe and the Jewish state. The EU is an important aviation market for Israel, making up about 57 percent of international flights, and Israel is a popular destination for Europeans traveling on vacation. Saim Kalis, vice president of the European Commission, said we expect to see more direct flights to and from Israel, lower prices, more jobs, and economic benefits on both sides. And that concludes the news portion of our show. Stay tuned for Ask the Source with Josh Reinstein. Hello and welcome to Ask the Source. I'm your host, Josh Reinstein, and we're here in the lobby of the beautiful Crown Plaza Tel Aviv Beach Hotel, overlooking the beach of Tel Aviv. My guest today is Ron Yuri, CEO of Crown Plaza Israel. Ron, thank you for being on the show. Thank you, Josh, for coming. Ron, you've been involved in tourism here in Israel for a very long time, and you've seen the growth of Christian tours to Israel. Why do you think so many Christians around the world are coming to Israel? Okay, Josh, uh, as a child, all of us, Jewish or Christians, uh, we all read the Bible. And what happened in the Bible, it's happened here in this country, mainly in Jerusalem. And I think if you want to feel it, touch it, and feel it in your heart, you have to come to this country. And that's why all the Christians from the world has to come here. And they already start coming, and we see the numbers growing and growing. Uh, our aim is to reach 10 million tourists, and most of them will be Christians. I hope. You know, you host in Jerusalem in the Crown Plaza there the Feast of Tabernacles. It's the largest tourist event in Israel and the biggest spiritual event for Christians who come to Israel. How does that feel to be a part of that, that pilgrimage to Israel during the Feast of Tabernacles? Okay. Uh, the Feast of Tabernacles for us is uh, not something new. We host the feast every year and we are looking forward to host our viewers uh, this year as well at the Crown Plaza in Jerusalem. Uh, feast is uh, all about joy. And hospitality is about joy, and that's what we know to do. To make the people that come to us feel joyful. And uh, we are a local uh, operator, but with an international brand. And quality is what we know how to do. And we work with the Christian market for years, and I'm sure this year we'll do even better. So I look forward to see our viewer in the Feast of Tabernacle this year in our hotel. You know, there's a lot of Christians who go to Jerusalem, but not a lot of them come to Tel Aviv. Why do you think Christians who come to Israel should take a night or two and stay in Tel Aviv as well? Yeah, I think anyone who comes to Israel has to experience Tel Aviv. Jerusalem is very different. It's very about tradition, about religion. But when you come to Tel Aviv, it's about the food, about the beautiful beach behind us. It's a 24-7 uh, life city. And if you are in this country, you have to experience the city. And it's before going to Jerusalem or before getting on your plane back to your own country. So in this hotel, the Crown Plaza, uh, Tel Aviv Beach, it's the right place and the right location to spend the night before or the night uh, upon arrival and to enjoy our beautiful hotel on the beach. You know, uh, tourism has grown in leaps and bounds in Israel in the last few years. Our Prime Minister just recently said that he wants in the next few years there will be 10 million tourists here. Where do you think the biggest growth will come from in the tourist market? Okay, there are different markets uh, that uh, we should put our uh, goal to bring the Christian market mainly, but the other markets as well. Uh, we see the Brazilian market, is a growing market outbound. Uh, we see, of course, China is growing big time. Uh, we're looking at India. India. Uh, we know there are 400 million uh, middle class that are all traveling all over the world. Russia, we see mega numbers. Uh, we have a hotel in the Dead Sea and they are all coming for treatment. Uh, so if we go South America, Far East, uh, North America, I think we only touch the surface. 
So 10 million, it's, it's, it's an achievable goal, and I think we can do it easily uh, if we put our focus in the right market and, and give the right joy and service that we know how to do. The Crown Plaza is one of the only hotel chains in Israel that have really made a concerted effort to reach out to Bible-believing Christians. What are some of the things you've done in order to get Bible-believing Christians to come to Israel, stay in Israel, and stay at Crown Plaza? Yeah, well, a few things we are doing. First, we work with our partners. Uh, we have uh, two operators around the world that are geared to that pilgrimage uh, market, and we provide them the best rate. Uh, we always give it on uh, half board, which is breakfast and uh, dinner. Uh, we know how to gear to them uh, from uh, buses, services, and the right food they are looking for. As well, we are traveling. We are traveling to different destinations with our team to preach, in, in, in a way, our beautiful hotels uh, to the pastors, and we join venture with them. And we do everything we can to get this market. We believe hardly in that market. We see that Christians who come to Israel go to Jerusalem, they go to Tiberias. What are some of the other locations you're seeing more and more Christians are trying to see here in Israel? I think an opportunity, if you are already in this country, is of course go to the, uh, we have the Dead Sea and the Red Sea. And we have a beautiful Crown Plaza in Elat, uh, overlooking the Laguna. And I think a Christian who come here can spend one night and then go to Patra and back to our hotel and take this opportunity. Petra is also one of the, the beautiful places in the world, like Jerusalem. Uh, so I, I think it's a great opportunity if you travel so long from your country, if it's Far East, South America, uh, US, take the opportunity, enjoy the culture, the variety of culture in this region. So it's not only Israel, it's the region that is so heritage and, and joyful in, in service that I think you should take the opportunity and enjoy the, the region. You know, we see that Christians are supporting Israel in a variety of different ways, through political support, through financial support, mm -hmm. from charities, through spiritual support, from prayer. Why is tourism support so important for the country of Israel? We know that uh, it's not only about hotels. Uh, tourism, it's uh, about everybody who deals with it. It's the, the taxi driver, it's the restaurant, it's the museum, it's the airline. So it gives so many jobs and so many uh, opportunities for businesses to enjoy it everywhere in the world. We know that in the world over a billion people travel uh, in 2012. And this is the future. We want people to meet, meet each other. And once you meet someone, you know him better and you have become an ambassador for this country. So I think we are great people, joyful people. We are loving other people, and the best thing is to experience the hospitality of the Israelis, and then hopefully the people that visit us will go abroad and tell the story, and more people will come, and then we create peace instead of hustle and war, which we don't want to be in that world. We want to be in a world of happy and joyful and peaceful. Uh, so that's, I think, tourism its the way to do it. And I'm happy to be part of that industry. Yeah. Well, Ron, there are literally tens of millions of people watching this show. What message do you have for our viewing audience? Okay, please come to my country and enjoy the beautiful uh, scenery and history and enjoy the Crown Plaza. Uh, we are a global brand with a local touch and we know how to give service. We have a beautiful hotel from north to south. I look forward to see you at the feast and many years to come. Thank you very much. Thank you for the opportunity. Tom. Thank you, Ron, for being on the show. Thank you. And thank you for tuning in to Ask of Source. I'm your host, Josh Reinstein. Now back to the studio. Up next, Shining Light from Israel. This morning, I had another talk with the German Chancellor, Herr Hitler. And here is the paper which bears his name upon it as well as mine. We regard the agreement signed last night 
as symbolic of the desire of our two peoples never to go to war with one another again. When Hitler rose to power, no one believed that he would actually do the things that he said. You know, our history teaches us something very simple. When an enemy says he's going to annihilate you, believe him. Iran today poses a danger that threatens to engulf the entire world in chaos. A nuclear-armed Iran is a grave danger to the peace and security of the entire world. Diplomacy has failed. Will sanctions work? If diplomacy doesn't work, the clock could run out. We've wasted years on failed diplomacy. And there's no chance that Iran will be talked out of its nuclear weapons program. Iran is believed to be expanding right now its uranium enrichment activity deep inside of a mountain bunker. Iran has tripled the pace of production of 20% grade uranium. They're transferring their facilities underground to be immune. Time is running out. They're racing towards acquiring a nuclear weapon. None of us can afford to wait much longer. Longer. <laughs> For the sake of our prosperity, for the sake of our security, for the sake of our children, Iran must stop. Be Iran. Stop now. Last time, the world was silent. This time, our voices will be heard. Stay tuned for the ICEJ report from the International Christian Embassy, Jerusalem. Welcome to our new episode of the ICEJ report. And today we are together with our international director, Juha Ketola. Welcome, Juha. Thank you, Jurgen. Juha, today we want to talk about West Africa. It's a huge part of the African continent. And until a few years ago, the Christian embassy in this part of the world was working basically in two countries, which was Nigeria and Ghana. But then three years together, you and I, we were traveling through uh, Finland. Mm -hmm. And in one of those little land country churches, suddenly the pastor got up and he prophesied. Tell me what happened on that evening. You know, I get goosebumps every time when we talk about this. Now this man of God, this pastor came up and he prophesied over ICEJ ministry and he said to us that the Lord will open 10 new Arab Muslim countries for our ministry and uh, those countries will be the ones that at the time of the prophecy Israel was for them an abomination. And uh just for you to understand, as you are listening to us, God did amazing things over, the, over this last couple of years or even months. And God opened doors for us into countries which we never thought he would open doors for us. Tell us what happened over the last month. It's exactly like Jesus says, uh, uh, ask of me and I will give you the nations as your inheritance. Yes. Now nations started to open up for us. Yeah. First, in uh, one of the Muslim countries in the northern Africa, almost 100% Muslim country. Hmm. But then the Lord started opening us more doors in Western Africa, yeah. Sierra Leone, Senegal, Niger. And you know, these countries, Niger, it's more than 90% Muslim. Yes. Senegal, more than 90% Muslim. Sierra Leone, 60% Muslim. And all of, in all of those countries, we have fully operational branch with national directors and board and everything 
and the whole body of Christ with our vision. And in Ivory Coast, we had to close down the Ivory Coast branch a number of years ago because of the civil war which was taking place in that country. But we could open it also after we went from Niger, we went over to Ivory Coast and we could re-establish that branch. Tell us what happened there. It's the resurrection life of Jesus. Now, what happened in Ivory Coast was that uh, we went in again after the war and we're connected through our Western Africa representative, Reverend Abdul Maika. Yes. We were connected to the whole body of Christ in Ivory Coast and all of them came together because we have a message of reconciliation. It, we were able to bring unity and then to speak also to the national uh, leadership of Ivory Coast uh, as one voice and, and, and uh, as our ministry and also in Niger. The national leadership, was. Uh, we met with them. And it was all over the media that people spoke about the Christian embassy came to our country to bring reconciliation to our nation. But uh, the Lord spoke to you over the last few weeks about other countries where we want to enter into. Tell us, what, were, what is the vision for us to go forward in the next couple of months? The Holy Spirit is carrying us according to the word that he gave us. Yes. More doors are opening the Muslim nations. And I uh, believe it will not be just 10 nations. No, it will be more. And then the whole Africa. We have now really uh, a real, not ideal, not, not, this is not a disillusion. This is a, a reality. We have doors open, people there in these countries, Burkina Faso, Benin, Togo, Guinea, Mali, Gambia. Some have 90% Islamic population, I read here. Of course, because the Lord spoke to us about yes. it. Yes. <laughs> so it's amazing. But we need, uh, we need funds to be, how to much, be honest about it. How much do it. we need? Uh, the, the budget that we have, it's about $50,000. We need $50,000, and I would say only $50,000. Well, as you have heard, we need $50,000 to accomplish this in the coming months. And let me tell you what you heard today in this last few minutes. This is nothing short of a miracle, what God is doing in the African continent today. And you can become part of exactly this exciting development, what is taking place in Africa. I want to personally invite you today to help us to go through those open doors. We feel in our spirit, we don't know how long those doors will be open. We need to move fast. We need your help. It's only $50,000 and we can reach entire nations, six nations in the continent of Africa. Please prayerfully consider to partner with us and to support Israel. We are your embassy here in Jerusalem. May the Lord bless you out of Zion. That's all for this edition of Israel Now News. I'm Yochanan El Rom. And I'm Erin Viner, reporting from our studio in Jerusalem. Please join us again next week for all your Israel updates.